for whatever reason, as someone who is young or even into your teenage years, no one wants to hear that you look like your dad, right? I don't know what it is about that, why we get so offended. It's not like someone says I look like the elephant man or Quasimodo, nothing like that. They're saying I look like my dad. And as I get older, I just have to admit it's true. I do look like my dad. There's no way around it. And so, you know, I, I think that's just genetics, right? That's our DNA at work. I have an older brother. I look like him too. I used to try to deny that fact. Um, I, I would have told you that I don't look anything like my older brother. And then one day I got a call from my older brother. He lives in North Carolina. And my older brother, he's a teacher there. He was out on the playground while this company from Atlanta had come up to his school to do sort of like a field day, a fundraiser sort of thing. And a random guy walked up to my brother and said, hey, this is weird, but are you David Palmer's brother? And he said, yeah. And they got to talking. And this guy had refereed flag football games for me in college and knew just by looking at us that we were siblings. Uh, your DNA is undeniable, right? It, it really is. I found this website. It, it has these pictures of people. You can like upload a picture of your parent and then yourself at that same age. And as you scroll through these pictures and as you look at it, I thought some of these looked like they were Photoshopped. The way that people's DNA sort of works out and your genetics sort of work out, it's clear who your parent is. And some of you may have heard similar things. Hey, you look like your dad. And, and it's, I don't know if it's the eyes, I don't know if it's the chin, the hair, whatever it is, the genetics are undeniable. I think in some ways, this is what the Apostle John is trying to do as he's writing to the second, third, fourth generation Christians that he's writing to. They have, they, these are men and women that are they're questioning their salvation. They want to be able to rest assured that they are children of God. And John is writing and he's saying, listen, a child of God, someone who has been born again, you've got family traits. The family traits are obvious for a child of God. And all throughout this book, and we're starting the last chapter today, but all throughout this book, John is listing these family traits, things like faith. You have to believe, he says, over and over again. Things like agape love. We've talked about that self-sacrificial, others over self type of love. He talks about obedience over and over and over again. These are the family traits. It's not, he's not telling the, the people that he's writing to, he's not saying, hey, look in the mirror. You're going to see this type of hair, this type of chin, this type of smile. He's saying, Lift, if you look in the mirror of your life, you should see these family traits, faith, obedience, love. And on the flip side of that, they're, they're questioning these false teachers. And he's saying, hey, look, look at them. Do they look like they're a part of the family? Do they have the same traits? In today's passage, we've actually got all three of those things mentioned. So if you want to turn in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 5, we're starting in verse 1. And here's what God's word says in verse 1. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Okay, going back to verse 1, as we dig into this today, he starts by saying that everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And right there we see this first family trait, this faith, it's belief. And the idea is that if you want to be born of God, if you want to be born again, you first have to believe that Jesus is the Christ. He is the son of God. This is how you enter into this new family. This is how you become born again. And when we are born again, these incredible things happen to us where, where you gain the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit enters into your life. And God begins to implant a new type of sort of spiritually genetic material into your life. 
so that the fruit of the Holy Spirit become evident in you. Things like love and joy and peace and patience, kindness. All of these traits become evident in the life of a believer. That's your new DNA. You evidence throughout your life this process of, of sanctification. That's what it's called. I want to know that you're out there today. Can you say sanctification? All right, you, you guys are awake. Just making sure sanctification is this process whereby we progressively become more and more and more and more like Jesus. Progressively, as you walk through life, after you've been born again, you should start to look more and more and more and more like your father. That's what John says. That's what it means to be born again. Now, before we move on, we start to see, we see this word believe brought up. And we haven't talked a lot about believe. He says that everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ, that, that's a verb, and it's a Greek verb, pistuo. Pistuo means more than just like an intellectual assent. It's more than me just saying, yeah, yeah, I believe. It's, it goes beyond that into a confident trust. In this text, believing equals confident trust. It's more than just intellectual assent. Now, how do I know that I've been born again? Well, I, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. How do I know that I believe? Well, where is it that I've placed my trust in this life? It's undoubtedly true that any one of us can say that we believe anything, right? I can say I believe it. A young woman can go out on a date with a guy for the first time. Hey, I believe this is the one for me. But there's a difference between saying that and saying I do, isn't there? One of those is intellectual. The other is expressing a confident trust that leads to an action. I can tell you I believe the Browns are going to win the Super Bowl this year. Don't laugh at that. I believe it, but I'm not betting my house on it. I don't have a confident trust that that's going to happen. I can look at this stool right here and I can say, listen, I believe with all my heart that if I sat on that, it will hold my weight. And if you said to me, okay, go ahead and sit down. And I said, I don't think so. I don't have confident trust. It leads to action. When, when he says that everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ Along with that comes this action of actually following him, obedience, as we'll see in the following passages. The second part of this is that, that this, and I'll admit, I'm not a great Greek grammar guy, okay? But when I read this verb, I find that it is in the present active indicative tense. Present active indicative. And what that means is that it expresses a continuation of belief that's happening. It's every day, all day, you're believing. You are continuing in your belief. He says that everyone who believes or continually believes that Jesus is the Christ. And this kind of, it's kind of a callback to chapter two, just a couple of chapters before. The people that John's writing to are struggling because there's this group of people that walked with them for a time they thought they were a part of the family and then they left and they've rejected the simple gospel. And John says this in chapter two, verse 19, he says that they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have what? They would have continued. They would have continued with us, but they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. It's this idea that we can't just one time express an intellectual consent or an assent to a truth. That belief is a continual believing. And understand that, that John is not saying here that you, you will lose your salvation if you stop believing. What he's saying is the evidence of your salvation is that you won't stop believing. And those who do weren't truly of us. And so you have those two pieces and this idea of believing. Now that is important to John. This idea of placing your confident trust is, it's incredibly important. In Matthew's gospel, he uses that, that verb, he uses it 10 times. In Mark's gospel, he uses it 10 times. In Luke's gospel, the word believe is used nine times. In John's gospel, it's used 99 times. 
This is a mark. This is our family trait, this faith and belief. It is a confident trust that leads to action, and it is a continual believing. Now, the rest of this verse is stuff that we've, we've covered quite a bit. It, he says this, everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. Now we move on to verse 2. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. Now, I've been incredibly proud of my daughter Kaya this year because she has worked so hard on her reading. Reading was not one of these things that came easy for Kaya. Um, I, you know, for some of you guys, some of you jerks out there, everything comes easy, right? Math, reading, whatever. For some of us normal people, it doesn't all come easy. For Kaya, it was reading that didn't come easy. And she worked so hard on it. Jarrah worked with her. I worked with her. We would just sit there and read books with her and listen. And there was a moment this last fall where Kaya was reading a book to me. I was sitting in like a recliner with my eyes closed doing the dad thing, you know, listening. And she had this moment. And I, I realized, the more that I've read with her, I've realized, like, I think all of us do this, where you're reading a, a, a page and your mind like fills in blanks, whether the words are there or not. I don't know if you've ever done this, but your mind fills in a blank before the word. And sometimes you just, you read the wrong thing. And so we had a moment, I laughed about it and I took a picture of this book so that we could show it. And so I'm gonna be Kaya, you're gonna be me and I'm gonna read it. And you're gonna see if you can find out where she filled in the blank, okay? Yes, we ready? All right. Chapter one. A new puzzle. One afternoon, Baba brought out a new puzzle. Want to join me, Yasmin? He asked. Yasmin looked at the box. It had a picture of a vegan. The box read 1,000 pieces. And in that moment, my eyes popped open and I said, let me see that. She turned the page. She was ready to keep going. Kaya, is there really a 1,000 puzzle piece picture of a vegan that they're doing here? I'm still confused about why she was thinking about that. I, I actually, I, I bring that up because I had one of those moments as I read verse two here. I had one of those moments and let's see if you can catch it. Here's what I did. By this, we know that we love God when we love the children of God and obey his commandments. Do you guys see it? Over and over and over again, that's been the message of John. If you love God, that will result in a love of the children of God and you'll obey God. But that's not what this says. He flipped the script on me. He, he, he mixed it up. He says, by this, we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. He's saying something that's different here. What he's telling us is that one of the ways in which we love people is by obeying God's commandments. And man, I'll tell you, I had to sit with that for a while. I had to really spend some time thinking about that. What does that mean? I love people by obeying God's commandments. I thought about that. I, I, I studied on that. I, I remembered this talk, or I can't remember if it was an article or a talk by John Piper. He's a pastor and an author. And he talked about how our culture is notorious for taking general big principles out of the Bible and focusing only on those big general principles. And he says that what we tend to do is we take a big general principle like love, like unity, like uh, human dignity. We take those big general principles and then our culture, because it doesn't actually know scripture, it takes those and it uses those general principles to trample on the specific commands of God's word. Now, how does this work out in practice? I want to give you three different examples. The first is, is one from Zurich, Switzerland in the 1500s. The Reformation happened in the, the 1500s. In Zurich, 15 years later, you've got this city that is incredibly 
zealous for the kingdom of God. They want to bring the kingdom of heaven and create it on earth. And within the Bible, they've latched on to that one principle, heaven, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, and the principle of unity within the church. And in doing so, these people who are zealous for God, you have to understand that. They're creating laws within Zurich, things like it's illegal to not attend church. It's illegal to, to play cards or to be found dancing. And what they're trying to do is legislate a relationship with God. But the real problem came about, uh, there are problems with that, by the way, but the real serious problem I want to talk about came about with something as simple as baptism. Now, of course, before the Reformation, the vast majority of people are baptized as infants within the Catholic Church. But now you have people who are reading the Bible for themselves, and that is revolutionary. They're reading the Bible in their own language. It's not just Latin that they're hearing. And now people are discovering the Gospels, and they are coming to Christ as adults and being born again, and then they're following this process laid out in Acts and in the epistles where people come to Christ and then they're baptized. And so now in Zurich, Switzerland, you have these people who are zealously reading God's word, coming to Christ and then being baptized as adults. But there's a problem. The church there is saying that's bringing disunity to the church. And in an effort to bring about the kingdom of heaven and a unified church body, they make it illegal to be baptized as an adult. And in 1527, six people are caught in the middle of the night baptizing one another in obedience to Christ. The next morning, they're taken down to a river by the authorities and they're drowned to death. In an effort to create the kingdom of heaven, this big principle of unity, they're trampling on the specific commandments of God. And we continue to do this in different ways. Now, I just want to tell you right, right now, this, the next two examples I have deliberately picked, the most difficult examples that I could find. And this is when it's not that fun being a pastor. And so I hope that you'll give me grace, and I hope that you'll hear, uh, hear my words with love, and I hope that you're, you'll allow yourself in your thinking to be provoked. How is it that that we allow general principles to trample on God's specific commands. First of all, write this down. General principles do not cancel out God's commands. They don't. The way in which our culture really does this, there's two examples that I want to talk about. The first is with same-sex attraction. And the reason that I've picked this is not because I have some sort of animus towards people who are same-sex attracted or... I, it's really not that at all. I've picked it because it's extremely painful. It's extremely personal and it, it's practical. It comes up all the time. How is it that I'm meant to live out my faith if I'm same-sex attracted? What, what do I do here? Now, before we begin, I wanna make a couple of things clear. The first is that I believe that same-sex attracted people exist. They're not pretending. They really are same-sex attracted. And I don't think that this should be particularly surprising, by the way, on a biblical worldview. Everything about this world has been affected by sin, has it not? My sexuality has been affected. My pride, my greed, my selfishness, my anger. Scripture says that all of us is impacted by sin and we cannot simply trust our feelings, our emotions, instead we have to compare those to what God's design is. And so I don't think that, that someone who is same-sex attracted is pretending. And I know that scripture doesn't give out a blanket exception. Hey, everything has been impacted by sin except for your sexuality. In that area, you can do whatever. That's, that's not how the Bible talks. The second thing that I want to be clear is that I don't think that it's a special category of sin. In the same way that, that we have to grapple with what God's word says about lust or greed or pride or selfishness or lying or anger or hatred or jealousy, 
or gossip. We have to grapple with how God's word applies to sexuality. We do. Now, what is the problem then? Well, the problem, of course, is that the same Bible that talks about God's love and God's mercy and God's grace also talks very specifically about sexuality. And I just want to call your attention to Romans 1. Romans 1, verses 24, 25, 26, 27 says this, Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie. They worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. Their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. Now, in our culture, we have gone to a place where we've said, can't we just talk about general principles when it comes to these topics? The Bible here says that God has a design for human sexuality, something that is natural and something that is contrary. And one of those is dishonorable. Now there's many other places where the Bible talks about many other sexual sins, but this is the one that's controversial and difficult. It's painful. And so that's what we're talking about today. Now people will argue, Hey, can't we just talk about love? Isn't it unloving to deny someone who is genuinely same-sex attracted sexual satisfaction and love, romantic love? Is, isn't that unloving? We pile too much upon them. Haven't they already been the minority? Haven't they already had to struggle through the challenges here? We, we, it's too much. Let's talk about promiscuity. Let's talk instead about being faithful and monogamous. It's fine Date whoever you want to date. Love whoever you want to love. Just don't be promiscuous. Marry, be faithful and committed. And, and listen, all of that sounds good if Romans 1 doesn't exist. But these general principles, they cannot cancel out God's specific commands. And you might try to say that that is unloving, but I would point you back to 1 John 4, 8 that says that God is love and he's incapable of giving an unloving command. And so we have to grapple with these challenges. We have to submit our flesh to the truth of God's word. And it is painful and it is a process. But what happens is verse three says, he says his commandments are not burdensome. And they're not. God doesn't ask us to do something and not give us the strength to carry it. The second example that I want to give to you is another controversial and difficult and thought-provoking one in our culture. It's, it's how we talk about and deal with the roles of men and women within family and within church. Churches have split over this. Families have struggled over this. Now, I want to be clear. God's word talks about men and women as equally created in God's image, equally valuable, equally loved. There is no doubt to that. But Ephesians chapter five talks about specific and different roles between men and women within the family. Looking at verse 22, we read this, wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. And husbands, you must love your wives as Christ has loved the church. And he gave himself up for her. Now, our world will tell us that that's old fashioned. This idea that there is a hierarchy or uh, that, a, that a husband is meant to lay his life down for his wife, just like Christ did for the church, and that the wife in her submission to Christ is going to submit herself to her husband in his leadership so that there's not always a constant butting of heads. There's not a constant frustration. And before you pull out all these 
Yeah, but abuse, and they, none of that applies to abuse, okay? If a husband is laying his life down for his wife, submitted himself to Christ, he's not going to be abusive. And if he is, that's, that's illegal, that's wrong, that's get out, okay? But to deny that God has created men and women differently is to deny the scriptures, to deny that God's word says in 1 Timothy and in Titus that the role of an elder, a pastor within a church is to be held by a male, is to deny scripture. And you can point to equality and human dignity, and those are biblical values, but they do not cancel out the specific commands of God's word. And it is fundamentally, and this is where you have to hear me, this, it is fundamentally, God's word says in 1 John 5, 2, it's unloving of me. It's unloving of me to not obey God's commands in these things. And it's unloving of us and you to change God's commands, the specifics for some sort of generalized principle and thereby rob God's word of its authority on these issues. When we share the truth of God's word, we do so in love. If you have anger or hatred in your heart towards a person or people as you share this truth, that's sin. But it's not unloving to share God's word. It says right there that it says, by this we know that we actually love the children of God when we love God enough to obey his commandments. Now, where you go from there on those issues, that's a longer conversation, but you have to see and understand that these general principles cannot cancel out God's specific commandments. We have to grapple with that. Now, moving on to verse three, we see that this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome to us. It is funny to me to sometimes hear people who aren't Christians talk about how oppressive Christianity is. That might be funny for some of you as well. I can tell you in my own life, what's oppressive is sin. Sin is the thing that's oppressive. And when I hear people talking about how oppressive these rules and these commandments in, in the Christian faith are, I think, man, it's like a person in jail telling me how good it feels to be free. God's commandments aren't a burden for us. In fact, you know, in, in Matthew chapter, well, let me find it here. Matthew chapter 11, verse 29, not only are God's commandments not burdens, burdensome, Jesus says that we can actually take, he says, take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I'm gentle and I'm lowly in heart, and you're gonna find rest for your souls. Man, doesn't that sound good? Rest in our soul? My yoke is easy and my burden is light. The commands of God, they're not burdensome for us. They may not be what the world tells us we should do. It, they may not be what our culture or our society tells us. But we can't run away from the specific commandments of God in the name of love when 1 John 5, 2 tells us that the way that we love people is by obeying those commandments. And these are hard words. What it means is that we have to each and every day die to ourselves and choose to continually place our trust in Jesus Christ. 